Hello, everybody. Welcome to the lecture on rock music in the 1980s. 1980 is a big, important year because it's about halfway through the rock music experience. Let's review real quickly what was happening in the 70s. We talked about how after the psychedelic rock genre crashed in the late 60s, that there was an emergence of these very different genres throughout the 1970s that included metal, glam, progressive rock, easy rock, roots, and punk rock. And we talked about all these individual bands there. Now, it's really nice for the purposes of this class that right around 1980, most of these bands experience a reduction in their popularity. A couple of the bands have deaths associated with them. Led Zeppelin, the drummer, John Bonham dies, Leonard Skinner, most of the band members are killed in a plane accident. And another important death is John Lennon, the former Beatle, will be killed in 1980 as well. The punk scene is actually quite short-lived, although it'll keep going on a little bit in the 80s. It never reaches uh, its degree of popularity that it had in the mid-70s, although we'll see a revival of some of those punk aesthetics when we get to the early 90s. Most of these other bands then kind of disappear from the mainstream. But Pink Floyd, I think they have their first number one hit actually in 1980 with We Don't Need No Education, particularly apropos for this class. And then most of the other artists become associated with an older music crowd. Remember now, the baby boomers are going to be another decade older. They're in their 30s and 40s and are probably settling down with kids and a family. So let's look at, and in this class, we're going to actually consider it going all the way 1991 because the next major change in rock and roll is going to occur in 1992. The big thing we have going on is that President Reagan was elected, which ushered in a new phase of conservative government. We were a long ways now from 1964 when we had the civil rights movement, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Reagan is going to bring in the idea of smaller government. His main message is that government is the problem, not the solution. We're going to see a reduction in taxes and a reduction in services provided by the government. We're going to start to see the emergence of the yuppies. And the yuppies are the hippies, the baby boomers that are now more grown up and concerned with material the yuppies are known for being on Wall Street and trading money and being much less idealistic than they were when they were in college and they were hippies. We're going to see the emergence of the AIDS epidemic, which is really going to bring an end to the free love principles of the late 60s because suddenly people are concerned about dying from a sexually transmitted disease. This especially affects the homosexual community, which had flourished in the 1970s, especially in association with the disco movement. And so there's going to be a major recalibrating of sexual freedoms in the United States. And AIDS, when it comes out, is a death sentence. We don't think of it as much that now, but in the 80s and 90s, it was probably the scariest disease for most people to get. The space race is still continuing. We have the space shuttle program, and that's an important part of the American experience. And we have the emergence of MTV. And MTV will have the most dramatic impact on rock and roll of these events, and we'll talk about that more as we go. The decade basically ends with the Berlin Wall falling in 1989 and sort of the end of the Cold War, which is a pretty significant happening, although we still see today there are tensions between Russia and the United States. In 1989, there's a, there's a thawing of the tension that had been going on really since the 50s in the Korean War. Europe is no longer divided between a communist side and a democratic side. The Berlin Wall separated. Berlin into the Russian side and the American side. In 1989, it went back to being Germany. And in fact, East Germany and West Germany finally become just Germany again. So what happens in the music? Well, an interesting thing happens. If you remember in the 70s, the music was filled with these massive productions and massive shows and large albums and everything was big and intense. And there was a real consolidation in the industry behind primarily these artists that we looked at. Well, in the 80s, as the listeners to this music start to grow older and buy fewer records, these same big record companies are looking for a way to bring in new listeners. And these new listeners are going to be the generation, are, are called Gen X listeners. And Gen X are people who are my age, and we were teenagers in the late 80s and early 90s. And so this music is going to be designed to cater to us more. The older generation, the baby boomers, will continue to listen to this music, and it'll start to be played and called classic rock in order to distinguish it from the music after 1980. And 1980 is a real turning point. Like I said, before 1980, that music is going to be considered pro classic rock, and from 1980 on, it's going to be considered modern rock, at least during the time. Now, as we listen back to this music, it all gets mixed together. But at the time, there's a pretty clear demarcation point between the generations. And the record company is going to start to integrate pop ideals into rock and roll more. How does that look? Well, heavy metal is going to continue to be a very important player in rock and roll. Another important genre is going to be called glam metal. Now, what is glam metal? Well, 
Glam metal is sort of a combination of heavy metal with that glam rock we listened to, or the arena rock, some of you are calling it. Okay, so glam metal is going to combine those two things, but it's going to combine it with pop music sensibilities. Talk about that more in a second. We have the emergence of pop rock, which is rock and roll that is catered towards popular music audiences, younger music audiences, and it's not as edgy and unexpected and rebellious as previous versions of rock and roll have been. And then lastly, we'll have alternative rock. During the 1980s, these big record companies really started to figure out the formula for selling music to younger generations in a way they hadn't been before. This decade was very much a top-down dominated decade, musically speaking. And basically the 70s, where we had these long, dramatic, slow songs and big albums and big concert tours in the 80s, we're going to start to move over to a shorter attention span. We're going to go back almost like we're in the 1950s again. And we're going to play these short, sweet, succinct songs. You're going to hear the form of these songs is very clear. A, B, A, B, C, B. Verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. And these songs are going to be designed to be played on MTV. And so the visual appeal and the way the artist looks and presents themselves is going to be very important. Some of the important artists we want to listen to for these genres, one of them is going to be Iron Maiden under heavy metal. A little more popular oriented is ACDC. And these are probably artists many of you are familiar with. Oddly enough, early 80s heavy metal, which had disappeared by the end of the 80s and early 90s, made a real comeback around the year 2000. So a lot of you know these bands. And Metallica. Those are going to be our three important heavy metal artists. And then as we move into glam metal, which has elements of heavy metal, but starts to turn more into pop music, we're going to listen to Van Halen, Bon Jovi. Now, there are probably a hundred of these glam metal bands that came out in the 1980s. We won't cover them all. We're going to look at a few of them and get the basic idea of what was going on there. And this was probably the most popular type of rock and roll in the 80s. Then under pop rock, we have some artists that really reach into the popular music airplay time. And those artists are U2, Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I'm going to include Bruce Springsteen in there. He's sort of an anomaly. And then on our alternative, we're going to listen to The Cure and R.E.M. These record companies really figured out that they could now steer people to one of these genres. And people would have the jocks in the school probably listen to glam metal. Many of the girls in the school probably listen more to pop rock and that sort of thing. And you would associate the musical genre that you listen to with where you fit into the school socially. Now it would sell you shirts and clothes and things that matched with the music that you listened to. The music became an important driver in the social setting. So again, 1980 is a pretty big turning year with the end of Led Zeppelin and really the end of the Beatles. In fact, people had still hoped the Beatles were going to get back together in 1980 when John Lennon was killed and the emergence of MTV a year later. What the record companies are going to do is they're going to start to blur the lines between pop music and rock music. If we look at here at the best-selling albums during the 1980s, you will see an interesting collection in a way that we almost haven't seen before of pop music and rock music. Remember, we're going to identify rock as music that is played on guitar, bass, and drums, written by the same person who performs it, and is generally has a rebellious attitude and perspective, and can reshape itself, meaning it changes over time. It doesn't remain very consistent. So people like Michael Jackson, we probably would not consider rock music because he doesn't write his own songs or perform any of the instruments on them. He's just, he's just the singer. He's the artist, right? So if we look at these, we see a mix of rock musicians with pop musicians. Whitney Houston's an example of maybe a pop musician. We aren't going to cover Dire Straits, even though they had a very big album, obviously, in 1985, with the important song, I Want My MTV. That's how important MTV was during the time. And some of these other artists you'll recognize as ones we're going to listen to, you 2 Bruce Springsteen. Some of them we've listened to before. Paul Simon's still hanging around there from Simon and Garfunkel. We have some new bands like The Police. Very hard to pick which bands to include on the list. I have to say The Police probably would have been an important one to include, but we didn't. We see Bon Jovi. And let me go back and add one other important band in the glam metal, which is Guns N' Roses. Although Guns N' Roses is going to start to push the edge of the glam metal paradigm into a new area. In the 1980s, the record companies started playing all their music on FM radio, unlike in the 1970s when popular music was on AM. So pop moves over to the FM dial, and now popular music stations and rock music stations are playing next to each other as you go through 
the FM frequency. And you'll see that there's a real integration here between the pop and the rock music and a lot of different artists. If you look at that, there's more artists involved here selling lots of records than we had seen previously, which was interesting. So the record companies really figured out how to run this show. None of these artists were small time garage band artists. Most of them were major headliners and the record companies promoted not just the music, but the entire persona, the way the person dressed, the way they danced, their attitude and perspective. And again, it's because it's going to represent your social status as a listener. So a lot of diversity in the 80s, oddly enough, even though it was tightly controlled by the record industry, there was not a lot of rebellious music coming out. And even the rebellious music that we'll see in the glam metal is going to be very intentional. The record companies will be marketing rebellion, which in some ways kind of defeats the purpose of rebellion. The one place we'll start to see a little more of a rebellious nature come in is this alternative music scene. And that will lead into the explosion in 1992 of alternative rock or grunge. Now let's go through and take a quick look at these artists and the songs that I'd like you to know by them. Uh, we'll start at the top here with Bruce Springsteen. And Bruce Springsteen was very distinct, actually. Firstly, that he was one of the few people that was popular both in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, his career started in the mid-70s, but he was able to transition into the more pop-oriented sounds of the 1980s in a way that most artists weren't able to. Most of those artists that we talked about last week didn't do as much of that. Uh, his uh, style was unique as well because he didn't really fit into those genres we talked about last week, that metal, glam, progressive, easy, roots, and punk rock. Might have been the closest to the roots rock, but he was a more urban musician, meaning he came from New Jersey. He wasn't from the southern United States. He wasn't like the Eagles singing about desperados and things like that. He talked more about kind of a working class mentality in New Jersey, and his songs centered on that. He sang a lot to poor white working class people in urban neighborhoods who were able to identify with that. And it was really kind of a, a new target audience and not one that has even before or after been targeted a lot. So Bruce Springsteen really has stood on his own in terms of the target audience and the lyrical content in his music. Uh, one of the other important things about Bruce Springsteen, he makes a frequent use of the saxophone in his songs. And we don't hear that a lot in rock and roll. That's pretty unusual. First song, Born Run in 1975, was the first hit that he had. And then Born in the USA in the 1980s, mid-1980s, was his biggest album. So I'd like you to be familiar with those two songs. Iron Maiden is important to include. Although Iron Maiden is not going to have any number one albums or top selling songs, they're still performing to this day. And they've put out something like 39 or 40 albums at this point and have a very strong following. There were other bands at the same time as them, Judas Priest and a few others that really took that heavy metal ideal to the next level. In fact, one of their albums is called Number of the Beast, and I've included a, their biggest song off that called Run to the Hills. And there was a lot of reference to Satan and dark topics in the vein of Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath. But most of the heavy metal bands up here aren't going to achieve the same level of record sales and popularity that Led Zeppelin did. And they'll be more on the fringe. They won't get a lot of airplay on rock music and certainly not pop music stations. And so their following is going to be more under the radar. Joan Jett is a, an important artist I would like you to know. And in fact, I didn't include her over here on the right. So let me add her. And she will be in the more of the pop rock vein as well. And Joan Jett is important because she's one of the few female rock stars that we've heard. We haven't heard many female rock stars uh, other than Fleetwood Mac since the late 60s. She got her start as a punk artist in the band The Runaways, and some of her colleagues in that band also went on to become famous artists, such as Lita Ford. Her most famous song is I Love Rock and Roll, but I'd also like you to be familiar with the Runaways song Cherry Bomb, which is 1976, right in that punk time when the Ramones were coming onto the scene. Van Halen, although they haven't had the longevity of some of these other bands, was probably the most important rock band in terms of transitioning from the 70s to the 80s. And we can hear that very clearly in their two songs here. In 1978, we're going to hear the song Running With The Devil, which is obviously making heavy metal references to the dark, satanic underworld. And then by 1984, they're singing a song called Jump, which is about uh, jumping, believe it or not, and doesn't really mean a whole lot. It's a light weight song and it actually becomes a number one hit. So Van Halen's going to go help transition us from the idea of heavy metal being long, drawn out, slow, heavy, sludgy songs to, hey, let's take all the instrumentation from heavy metal and the aesthetic of heavy metal that Led Zeppelin was using, that Iron Maiden and ACDC were using, and make them into pop music. 
And for a big part of the 1980s, that's going to be the scene right here. We're going to have these glam metal bands, Bon Jovi and Van Halen being probably the two top sellers, but there's going to be quite a few others in there that bring that glam metal aesthetic to the pop music realm. And so record companies are going to say, hey, we can sell more of these heavy metal records if we make them into this glam metal. They're also going to pull a lot of the glam rock sound that we heard before from David Bowie and Queen, right? And they're going to really incorporate all these aspects from heavy metal and glam in the 70s, but combine it with this kind of pop music sentiment where we're going to have the three minute long hit song. And so let's look at this glam metal phenomenon because it is the largest phenomenon in rock in the 80s. And again, I'm going to suggest that Van Halen was the band that helped to really start this phenomenon. And what they're going to do is they're going to take the ideals from those 1960s bands we talked about before. They're going to take from metal the dark lyrics and heavy guitars of Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. We're going to take the look and image from that heavy metal, but then we're going to combine it with the look and image of glam music. Let's see how that looks. So this is an image of Led Zeppelin in the 1970s. And we'll see we had the lead singer with the long blonde hair and the guitarist with the, the brown hair. They've got long hair. Um, and then what Van Halen is going to do, very similar in that image. This is Van Halen. You'll see we have the lead singer with the blonde hair, guitarist with the long black hair. And this imagery is going to get cemented in the idea of what it means to be rock and roll. And everybody's going to imitate it. Van Halen's going to start writing these three-minute hit songs that become popular. They almost become pop rock, okay? So they're going to span these three areas. And now if we move on over to some of the other 1980s artists, we're going to see the same thing, the same look. And what we're seeing there is sort of that androgynous look that we saw in David Bowie and we saw in some of the punk bands. And we even got in Queen where by this point, the lead singer of Queen is coming out as gay. Elton John is coming out as gay. There starts to be a real crossing over between the machismo sound of early heavy metal and this more effeminate look of glam metal. Another band, Poison, you could see all the makeup. These guys look like women. Def Leppard, there's probably 30 or 40 of these bands I could go to. This is Bon Jovi, similar idea. And yeah, Twisted Sister took some some things a little further he's getting a little silly and extreme with the makeup so the idea that you know ozzy osbourne had brought in about shock rock combined with david bowie's effeminization of the all-male groups combined with pop rock culture gives us glam metal and most of the 80s were those bands i'm just going to jump ahead a little bit here to bon jovi they were the other biggest glam metal band in the 1980s along with van halen Interestingly, they came from New Jersey as well, like Bruce Springsteen we talked about earlier, uh, and had some of that working class lyrics in their song, which was interesting because compared with the glam metal lyrics that were all very much about partying and girls, Bon Jovi's lyrics had a little bit more weight to it. This glam metal, sorry to touch back on that real quick, the topics in glam metal are also going to be very shallow. They are not going to be deep, meaningful, reflective lyrics. They're going to be about partying, drinking in particular, Girls, motorcycles, and fast cars. Another important female artist of the time was Pat Benatar. And she was also in the pop rock genre as a crossover artist. Uh, one of the few female rock stars again. You probably will recognize some of her music. She's the first female to start playing on MTV. And she comes out with some of the big hits in the late 70s, early 80s. Heartbreaker and Hit Me With Your Best Shot. I'd like you to know both of those. ACDC was a heavy metal band from Australia. And they now have the number two selling album of all time in Back in Black. They weren't as big in the early 80s as some of these other bands I've been talking about. But for whatever reason, around the year 2000, there was a real revival of interest in ACDC's music. They are perhaps more well-known than they were during their heyday in the, around 1980. They do not ever become glam metal, but they are more pop-oriented than Iron Maiden was. Their lyrics aren't as dark or shocking their songs are more melodic and catchy, and they're able to appeal over time to a broader audience than someone's like Iron Maiden or even Metallica. Another important band in the 80s was U2, and U2 really straddled the pop rock and alternative genres by being perhaps the only band in the 1980s that was concerned at all about some sort of idealism in terms of bettering the world or bettering people. They grew with songs with some sort of social political concern. There's racism or riots in Ireland or the environment, and they continue to this day to have that focus in their music. 
and really the only rock band in the 80s to, to have that. They were played regularly on popular music radio stations and on rock music stations. One of the few artists to be able to do that. Going more alternative, The Cure was a very important band in the 80s because they're going to start to give rise to the new paradigm in the 90s. So the 80s are going to be all about partying and girls, unless you're you 2 For the most part, this glam metal is going to be really focused on, on those shallow aspects. The Cure is going to be singing to people who don't quite fit in with that. As you look at these videos and songs from The Cure, you're going to see a real shift in how the artist presents themselves. And this shift is going to lead us into the 1990s. For the first time, you're gonna see the artist, the lead singer, not even looking at the camera when he's singing and having shadows over his face and singing in a low inward turning style with lyrics that are almost mournful and sad. And what we're gonna have is this transition from the 80s, wow, look at me, I'm the rock star. I'm David Lee Roth, frontman for Van Halen. I want everyone to watch me too. Hey, I'm the lead singer for The Cure, and I don't want anyone to watch me. I want you to put these headphones on and go home and listen to this song by yourself on your Walkman. And so The Cure starts to bring in that idea, that alternative, the person who maybe isn't so popular or maybe doesn't feel like they're quite fitting in and maybe isn't so happy with life and the world and the way things are. And that's going to give explosion to the grunge scene, which is going to happen in 1992. And the grunge scene is Generation X's response to the baby boomers impact on the world. And just like in 1967, when the baby boomers rebel against the establishment in 1992, Gen X is going to rebel against this music from the 1980s. The Cure is kind of going to lead that path, interestingly enough. The music is going to start to turn inward in a way it hadn't before. Another important band leading into the 1990s is Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses fits in this glam metal genre, but Guns N' Roses is going to start to turn the page into that more rebellious nature again. When you watch their videos, there's more shocking and disturbing imagery than we'd seen in a lot of the glam metal, and they start to have a bit of that punk aesthetic coming back. Now, a lot of that is probably because they were on pretty heavy drugs and doing things they shouldn't be. They were sort of the bad boys of rock and roll coming back again in a way that we had lost in a lot of the 80s. Though now it sounds fairly similar to the other 80s music, was pretty rebellious at the time when Welcome to the Jungle came out. Suddenly we weren't singing about girls and cars and parties. We were talking about how horrible life was. I think they're referring specifically to Los Angeles. The article even mentions that some of that rebelliousness reminiscent of the early Rolling Stones, and they, they really did do that. They set the stage for the grunge revolution in 1992 along with The Cure. Those are the two bands that probably said, hey, we're ready for something different. When these albums sold that many, it became clear that people were looking for something new. Two remaining important bands I would like you to know about, Red Hot Chili Peppers and Metallica. Red Hot Chili Peppers were the 1980s or 1990s version of the Beach Boys, meaning they're the Southern California sound. And they're going to incorporate a lot more of the funk sounds of the 1970s into it, but they're going to be white performers performing this, not African Americans. And lastly, we have Metallica. Throughout the 1980s, Metallica had been a fringe heavy metal band similar to Iron Maiden. Certain people listened to their music, but they certainly weren't played on the radio very often, and their record sales were mediocre. A lot of people would be wearing Iron Maiden or Metallica shirts around, but it was certainly no competition for someone like Bon Jovi or Van Halen. And it wasn't until 1991 that Metallica bridged that gap and brought heavy metal more into the mainstream without having to become glam or pop rock. So Metallica's album in 1990 was really important by saying, look, we can sell and be popular and be heavy metal. And the heavy metal that they're playing is substantially heavier than Led Zeppelin's heavy metal of the 1970s. Heavy metal survives into the 1990s in a large part because Metallica keeps it going and manages to cross over into a more popular aesthetic without having to give up the heavy metal sound, without having to become glam metal and start dressing like women, without having to become pop so all this is going to set the stage for the next revolution that's going to start in 1992, where we're going to reject big parts of this, most specifically the glam and the pop rock sides. And we're going to combine heavy metal and alternative music, and that will give us what we call grunge music.